I'd like to uh, once again welcome everybody. And you'll notice in your bulletins there's a insert of upcoming events. Um, everyone, whether you're a member of this church or not, is certainly welcome to attend these events, and there's a lot going on. So please come and join us. Okay. I'd like to also invite everyone now to come on up. This is our cross that we place flowers on every year. Uh, please feel free to come forward and place a flower on the cross. Come as you're led. Could the ushers come forward to receive the offering? Please. Please. 
Let us pray. Holy Father God, you have blessed us in every way. Father, help us to be joyful and generous givers, and we would ask that you would receive these tithes and offerings today as tokens of our love for this church and for this ministry. May you bless them and multiply them and send them forth from this place to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. In his holy name, amen. This next song we're about to do is going to kind of be picked up here and there throughout the message today. This is a song we've been doing, not we, but that has been done at this sunrise service for years and years. It's written by a, a, a friend uh, from Hillside, Terry Ransom. He wrote this song to go along with the Easter message. And there is a, uh, the verses kind of correspond to the different messages from uh, the the, the Easter sermon, but the refrain is one that is going to be repeated, and we're going to ask you to sing along, so I'm going to teach it to you. The refrain goes like this. I'll sing it once, and I'm going to ask you to join me. It goes like this. It's written in your bulletin if you want to follow along. He is alive. He is alive. Jesus, my Lord, is alive. He rose from the dead just like he said.
Georgia. Well, it was. It was after the Sabbath at first day's dawn, amid trembling, tumbling grounds, stood Mary and Mary in blinding light as the Lord's own angel came down. Robed white as snow at the edge of the tomb, he raised his voice to say, Be not afraid, for Jesus is gone. He has conquered all death on this day. He is alive. Jesus, my Lord, is alive. He rose from the dead just like he said. Jesus is alive. Angel was clear and calm in their fears as the women the crucified one After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Great to see everybody here. I know some of the uh, some folks will remember that song. We're here the first time it was played 21 years ago. It's a wonderful celebration to gather and celebrate the uh, resurrection of the Lord. Looks like we're going to have a beautiful sunrise, going to have a glorious day, and it's been so much fun watching all the work that's taking place around here. All the volunteers and preparing the church and making breakfast and putting these chairs out and we don't pay them much yeah but they do this for one reason they do it because the Lord is risen he wants everybody to know it matter of fact you know if we turn the volume up here we'll let the people know that we're still sleeping it's amazing that first Easter nobody was anticipating his resurrection the women weren't out there looking for the resurrection. They'd come out. As a matter of fact, what it says in the 20th chapter of John is that Mary asked questions. Says, They've taken our Lord. Where have they put his body? Nobody was expecting him to rise from the dead. This is the game changer. This is the linchpin in all of history. It's either go home or go on. Everything, everything hinges upon the resurrection. But nobody at that point was expecting that Jesus would do this thing that he had talked about. Even though he had expressed, he said the Son of Man would be betrayed and turned over and, and crucified. One of the things I think was, when we, when we think about that crucifixion, his crucifixion was seen to be far more violent than, than many that had taken place at that time with the Romans. Occurred. And I think the reason is, so there'd be no mistake, the people that had seen him abused and beaten and scourged to the point where he was virtually bleeding to death 
He was crucified on the cross, and then we had a soldier who put a spear through his side. There'd be no doubt of anybody there that, that he indeed was dead. And so there'd be no doubt if he was no longer in that tomb, either the body was stolen or something miraculous had happened, but there was no mistaking that he was dead. And so the women are up here there and, and shaken. And of course, we see over and over again in Scripture, more than 360 times in Scripture, you know what the Lord says or an angel says? Don't be afraid. When, when we're in the, in the midst of great power, it's natural to be afraid. But in the Lord, what this means is, in the power of the Lord and the truth of the resurrection, no matter what happens in our life, no matter what struggle, what we deal with, you know what? It's never over. Imagine the women going up to the tomb that day. They must, they must have been thinking about all the things that had got wrong. They must have been thinking about the regrets they had, what they could have done differently, that Jesus had been put to death. You know, we all have some regrets, one or the other. We're all things we like to do over differently. We think our lives have become a mess. Just before this service began this morning, we had a... We had a pile of notes that were left at the cross at our men's retreat last week and another pile of notes that were left at the cross at our Good Friday service. And people had written down all those things that were either burdens that they had been carrying, struggles, addictions, awful memories, things that had just been nagging and, and burdening piling on top of us, weighting down on our shoulders, and we, we burned him in that fire there. And the promise of this resurrection, the promise is that everything the Lord says he was going to do, he does. And, and when, you, when you think about it, in the church, if, if the disciples, if they were creating this story that people would believe, to come up with this idea of a resurrection, if it wasn't true, because it disproved Christianity, all they would have to do is produce a body. All they would have to do is find an eyewitness, somebody who said it didn't happen. <clears throat> There's only one person who would betray Jesus, and what happened to him? He didn't testify that it wasn't real or true. <clears throat> he killed himself through regret. So in the early church, they... They could have done anything to, to sort of push forward this idea of this new faith, this sect of Judaism. Because said we had this wonderful teacher, that, that this man who showed us a better way to live. But when they came up with this idea of the resurrection so revolutionary, so impossible to dismiss, that for us to lose this faith, for it to be squashed, all they would have to do is find a viable witness. All they would have to do is produce a body. All they would have to do is have some evidence it didn't happen. But the evidence is overwhelming. You realize at that point there, there, was, there was no Christianity. There was no followers of Christ. Jesus never walked more than 100 miles in his life, and yet in every nook and cranny across the world, they are gathering this morning to celebrate one thing, not the teaching of Jesus, not, not the wonderful love he professed and forgiveness and new hope. They're, they're gathering around the world to celebrate the resurrection. So from a, from a group of, of two women who to a tomb, one-third of the world testifies as Christians. As a matter of fact, even in, in this nation, you think how many years ago that we sort of moved into a post-Christian world? How many years ago we took prayer out of schools and and then all of a sudden, it, you know, for, for young people, like when I grew up, we were sort of surrounded with Christianity, surrounded with people of belief. Now what we find out is, even though we get a sense that there's fewer and fewer believers or people who moved away from, you know what? Three quarters of the people in this country are professing Christians. Virtually 70% of people in this country, not just Christians, 70% of the people in the United States of America believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you go in and you, when you listen to culture, you would, you would think that it's a fringe little group. There's never been a person in all of history that's had as many books written about him than Jesus, who never wrote one himself. 
Jesus never wrote a song in his life. There are more songs written about Jesus Christ than any person in all of human history. And what Jesus proclaimed, when he said, when he was when he was tested by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, when he's tested by them, and he's claiming to be the Messiah, claiming to be the Christ, the Son of Man and the Son of God, and he said, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? Because this proof of Christianity would be really easy. All you got to do is find Jesus wanting in any way. All you have to do is find him guilty of any minor sin. And all you have to do is prove, all you have to have some evidence, any evidence that he did not rise from the dead. But he did. And hope lives. And you know what that means? For us, whatever struggles you've had, whatever things don't work out, your frustration, it's never over. There is always hope. There is always the promise of Christ because the one thing that remains true in this world is that everything happens just as he said. Now I hope you don't get too excited because the way we break up this service is I'm going to speak two more times. So don't think you're done and it's time for breakfast. But I, I just hope you understand that we are gathered here for that one reason. It's not to celebrate somebody who lived and was a storm figure 2,000 years ago, even though we do recognize that, but the living Lord is alive and well and among us here today. Amen? Amen. Amen. what happened this day witness the way of the Lord for it's true he'll meet you in Galilee it is then that the world will know what you know the Lord has at last set you free he is alive Jesus my Lord is So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go ahead to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. When the chief priest had met the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Our, our faith hinges on the reality of the resurrection. If Jesus didn't arise from the dead, it really, it really is game over. And we all go back home and go to sleep. And so that this, this has been challenged through the years and always come up short. The question is, what is the authority we believe in? What, what do we trust? I'll tell you, the older I get, uh, the less I'm impressed with the experts who claim things and want me to believe things and the more skeptical. Yeah, I was a professional journalist and, and part of the thing is you had to chase the evidence wherever it went. I want to see some facts. I want to see information, something that's reliable. It drives me crazy how little I can trust in. So two days ago, I see this story which talks about how coffee drink, you drink at least three cups a day, and it, it, it helps clear your arteries out. I'm like, all right. I'm going to have some clear arteries. 
And I went to bed that night feeling good about this vice I have for drinking coffee. The next morning, I'm reading through the news feeds, and you know what it says? They want to put warning labels on coffee in California. Warning labels, and it could kill you because because there's chemical coffee when they when they roast the beans that could be carcinogenic. How often the experts tell us one thing: it's okay to have this now; it's not okay to do that. And every time there's a new diet, you're not supposed to eat any meat at all. It's like, well, no, eat only meat. You know what? I don't trust any of them. I don't believe in any of them. But what I want to know is, is what, what I can put my faith in, what's reliable, what doesn't fail me. Everybody at one point or another in life, everybody has failed me. Everybody's let down. Even people love me. I failed myself. I let myself down. But then I look in the gospel. And, and here's what you'll, what you'll hear is, this, oh, well, you know, the stories of the resurrection, they, they were written, you know, uh, generations later. It's just not true. There are eyewitnesses. Is that two of the Gospels written by eyewitnesses? Now, they were compiled. The Bible was compiled. was still a couple hundred years later that all the scriptures put together. But the Apostle Paul, who wasn't even a believer at that point, his letters began circulating 20 years after the resurrection. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians, listen to these words. Paul makes it pretty clear. 1 Corinthians, written about 55 AD, about 20 years after Jesus died. Here's what Paul says. He says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By the gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. He said, for what I received, I passed on to you as a first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom were still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then the apostles, and then last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. So when Paul's writing this court, he's saying, I'm reminding you of the things I already told you about. These things of first importance. Jesus died for our sins. He rose again and appeared to Peter and the twelve and to five hundred at a time. And he said, and they are, they're still alive, most of them. Some have fallen asleep. Now, it's interesting terminology. Some have fallen asleep. See, see, once we have this resurrection, there is no death. It's just a transition. What he's saying is that, that the body may not go on, but the spirit lives forever. And Paul said, this is of first importance. He said, matter of fact, if you want to ask this, if people are still alive, go ask them. All it would have taken is for somebody who would, who would claim to have been a witness to say, no, it didn't happen. Because when we look in history, what happens is we love to rewrite history, right? <clears throat> Once again, things that I was taught growing up, I had some heroes I was taught about. We had history books. These are people we admire and look up to. We're tearing their statues down now. The people that were held up because of their, their character and their for their integrity, whatever it is that they, we built statues and monuments to, and now we're covering them up. You know why? We have modern sensibilities. We look at the past and we say, well, we no longer honor. They, they said the wrong thing, did the wrong thing. Okay, I'm not going to disagree with that. They're, they're human. So, so we have to, well, we look through this filter, this lens, and decide who our heroes are. The Word of the Lord has never changed. And so for what Jesus had taught and did 2,000 years ago, I would challenge you, read through the Bible. Read through the words of Jesus. Find one thing that you need to change. Find one thing that doesn't work here and now today. Find one reason you would find Him lacking. The Apostle Paul says, testify 
And, and by the way, here's one of the, the most fascinating aspects is that we know in the early church that Paul, being a devout Jew, was, was a, uh, an enemy of Christianity because he thought it was a sect that had found us. He thought that, that Christianity was violating their law. And so Paul was persecuting the Christians. He was going to foreign lands. Well, then he has. He has a conversion experience. He has an experience with the risen Lord. Okay, so then he spends time in, in sort of learning and meditating. And then after this, he goes to see Peter. And he said he's so specific. He spends 15 days with Peter. Now imagine this. If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, if Peter the Twelve had not actually experienced the risen Lord, then you have this man who's an enemy of Christianity, and he shows up saying, I've seen the risen Lord. If Christ wasn't raised, they'd say what? This guy's coming to get us. They wouldn't trust him. But they do trust him. Because Paul had been an enemy of Christianity uh, appears and he says, I've seen the risen Lord. And they're like, indeed, he could have seen the risen Lord because they know he is alive. And because he is alive. And because everything he says comes true 2,000 years after that, we don't have to change any of his words. We don't have to rewrite anything in here. Because he lives, we live also. We don't die. We sleep. We transition. And because of that, there's nothing that we lose here. There's nobody we've lost here. There's nothing that we haven't made a mess of that he can't restore and fix. Praise be to God. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Yeah, it was interesting when Jesus was uh, spending three, three and a half years in his ministry. How often he'd perform miracles and the blind would see, the lame would walk, the deaf would hear, and they'd tell him, say, don't, don't tell anybody about this. And one of the reasons he didn't he didn't want them telling everybody is he knew as soon as people heard about the lame walk and the blind scene is that is that pretty soon he'll be just gathered around and, and knocking the doors down in the synagogue, they'd be flooded around for what? For physical healing. So he didn't want people just coming for stuff, right? Be coming for the wrong reason. That happened that's I think that's one of the reasons why sometimes we don't we don't get all the answers to prayers we want, because indeed if we were laying hands on everybody and everybody got healed, it, that they'd be breaking the doors down, not for Jesus, but for stuff. Be fixed. So Jesus would tell them, you know, and so when they would ask for signs, by what authority? How often he was he was mocked. The story in the second chapter of Mark where a man who's lame and 
and his friends are carrying him on the mat. They, they want to bring him to Jesus to be healed, and there's this large crowd around the house, and so they can't get to him, so his friends carry the mat onto the roof of the house, and with their bare hands, they'd like rip a hole in the roof, and they lower the man in front of Jesus, and Jesus sees the layman. You know what he says? Your sins are forgiven. Well, the guy could have walked. He didn't come for a sins forgiven, but Jesus knew his greater need. It was a spiritual need, what a physical need. So then, as usual, the people who practice religion, who do nothing but get us in trouble, but the people who, who follow religion do nothing but muck it up, they're like, by what authority do you do this? How dare you? Only God himself can forgive sins. And what's Jesus saying? Like, just to show you that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to tell this man to take your mat, get up and walk. This but that you would know the Son of Man's story. He tells me, he says, pick up the mat, pick it up and get out of here. So a man picks up the mat and he walks off. See, Jesus proved he had authority. But over and over again, he was mocked and he's still mocked today. It's no ridicule to faith. Just as wrong today when Jesus went to the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. His daughter had died, and, and Jesus shows up, and, and there's weeping and crying. Jesus says, don't cry, she's not dead. She's not dead, she's asleep. And he laughed at him. And so he brings Peter, John, and James. He goes in, and he holds a little girl's hand. He says, he says get up, little girl. And, and she does. He proves his authority in word and in deed. And so when the religious leaders kill joys that they are, and by the way, in case you're not mistaken here, we do not practice religion because it does not lead to salvation. It only leads to frustration and condemnation and death. So we have nothing to do with religion. We are followers of Jesus Christ and the resurrection. And by the way, part of the issue we get in the church, people want to argue about, you want to talk about Jonah, you want to talk about Noah's Ark, you want to talk about... Let's talk about the resurrection. Let me tell you, if you cannot deal with the resurrection, none of the other stuff matters. And when you recognize and understand that he is alive and rose from the dead, that other stuff is minor things, right? It's a game changer. And so when the religious leaders, and then once again, you know, they come to Jesus and they're like, <clears throat> perform some miracle, do some tricks for us. And by the way, don't do anything down here because, you know, magicians can do it. Show us some sign in the sky. Do something here that, that was going to make us believe. You know what Jesus said? A sinful, adulterous people, a faithless people, they ask for a sign and none will be given it. Except for the sign of Jonah. And, and just as Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. And Jesus says, when I've been lifted up, I will draw all people. When he is resurrected and raised all people, that's why one third of the people in the world, one third people, call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. So nothing's changed in 2,000 years. There's still people that, that mock those of the way, mock people of faith. Talks about in the end times there'll be a falling away of the faith. Don't be discouraged. And, and don't and don't think that science is, is against us. It's not at all. I love it. Here's I think it's fascinating is that, that that mockers, just as Jesus faced mocking and people who derided and wanted to make fun of his authority and power. I think it's fascinating that, that people who just believe in materialism they, they just believe in naturalism. We can explain everything. And all of a sudden, you, you see thousands and thousands of people about these out-of-body, these, these supernatural experiences near death. And I love so the, the materialists, and by the way, it's not science, because the science is in the other direction. The science is there's some of these real experiences that can't be denied. Of course, so the answer for people materialists are, well, you know, people have a near-death experience. Said it, it, It's just that, uh, it, it, it's just that, they're, they're, they're able to hear what's going on, and so they're aware of what's going on, that's all it is. Except, people that have these experiences will come back and say, 
I heard every conversation. I even conversation in another room. And one of my favorite stories is a woman who is blind, been blind since childhood, near-death experience. She comes back and describes everybody who walked in the room and what they were wearing. Because she came back and she couldn't see, except when she was a near-death experience. And I love the story of the man who, when he, when he uh, had near-death experience, he came back and started describing, I was floating in the room, I heard everything and saw everything. He says, well, no, 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 that wasn't out of death experience. That's just your brain, your mind working. He said, really? Well, there's a shoe on the roof of the hospital. And sure enough, when they checked, there was. Science doesn't invalidate that we have a soul that goes on, it validates it. It's the materialist and the naturalist who mock this and are absolutely dead wrong. And the sad thing is, if you heard that, if you saw this evidence that is overwhelming, that we don't die, we live on, there's not, you know, if you actually saw the evidence, wouldn't you celebrate? We say, wow, we thought this was all there was. Isn't this great that there's not? But they don't. They don't. And they don't realize it because Jesus lives. It means not only do we live, but everything that we have lost along the way, everything that we find that, that we grieve over, those loved ones, it does not end here. And what the Lord says is, will you tell somebody about it? Will you tell somebody about it? Will you proclaim the good news? The gospel means good news. Everything he says, and by the way, I think the most amazing verse in Scripture, Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 7, that Jesus, about to go to the cross, tells his disciples, it's for your own good I'm going away. It's for your good that I'm going away. If you all show up next week, because by the way, is Easter people? Easter just in the day. Easter's every day. We celebrate, we gather here, we remember it. Easter's every day. Y'all show back up next week. I'm going to explain that verse of Scripture. When Jesus says, it's for your good that I'm going away. It's a marvelous story. And it doesn't end here. We just need to proclaim it. Amen? Amen. Jesus appeared to those who believed to witness his hands and his face. And know for themselves and all the world the fullness of God's perfect grace. He said, teach them my ways and the truth of my words so all the nations can hear it. Baptize them all in the name of the Father to be with his whole. is the Lord has arisen and there is breakfast. <laughs> Good hot breakfast. Trust that received the benediction. Lord, we're just so grateful for the evidence. We're so grateful, Lord, that everything you say is going to happen, happens, Lord. We ask that you to bless this day. Make, make your life more real to us. Bless the food we're about to receive in this gathering. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.